Hi, Kirsty. Hello, hi. How's it going? Good to see you. Very well, thank you. Nice to see you. How's the weather in London today? It's actually very, very sunny. We're quite lucky with it. At least we can sit in the garden. <laughs> oh, very nice. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad day here in Lausanne as well. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, Kirsty. Welcome, everybody online to another uh, edition of SportWorks Talks uh, webinar series. Uh, great to have you all with us here this afternoon and great to have Kirsty here uh, to talk about a really important topic um, in our sports industry. So. Um, I want to say uh, Kirsty is going to give us a great presentation today uh, and what I would ask is if you've got any questions we'll save them towards the end of the presentation and as we do we'll go through those um, as many as we can uh, to answer those questions that you have um, that, you, that you have during the course of the, of the presentation um, and then if we can't get to your answers then we'll, we'll share those later uh, online through the, through, the, through, the, through the platform. So I want to say welcome everybody um, and I'm now going to hand over to Kirsty. welcome. Thank you very much, Christian. So hello, everybody. Um, as Christian mentioned, my name is Kirsty Burrows. I'm the Managing Director of Sports Rights Solutions and here to talk to you today about the prevention of harassment and abuse in sports and specifically the role of sports organisations. So it's quite a whistle top tour at the beginning, just an overview. Um, but I hope that you'll find it interesting. And, and as Christian said, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Am I right to start the presentation, Christian? Wonderful. There we go. So I'd like to, first of all, just quickly thank Carrie Ragaherman and Lucy Cunningham, who have been instrumental in helping me put together this presentation for you today. Um, and my team that we work together we wouldn't know what to do without them. Um, we're going to be going through a couple of points. So we're going to be looking through sport as a microcosm of society, the issue of harassment and abuse in sport, where our responsibilities lie, some consideration for major sporting events, the current context related to COVID and materials and resources, and all of that with a presentation of 25 minutes. So we're going to be doing a very high overview, um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have afterwards. And also we can discuss further in the community as well. So Celia Brackenridge noted that since Organized sport is a feature of the global economy. Inevitably, child protection in sport is part of the associated global flows in sport, whether in events management, scientific inquiry or policy development. And I really like this quote because this is something the prevention of harassment and abuse in sport and child protection, um, which can be one of the same. Uh, we can talk about that <laughs> a little bit later, but they do impact all aspects of organized sport. So it's a, it's a really good quote to try and show really the scope of this subject. So I'd like to start by talking about the concept of harassment and abuse. So some of these statistics are um, quite disturbing. And um, please, if anybody would like to reach out or, or needs any further support or would like to take some time and perhaps come back to this webinar later, please feel free. And my email is also at the end of this email in, in case you'd like to speak further. But this is a statistic from the Council of Europe and we're talking here about society, not sport specifically, but about one in five children in Europe are the victims of some form of sexual violence. We also know that one in three women have experienced physical and or sexual violence at some point in their lifetime, and this does not include sexual harassment. Statistics also show us that one in six men have experienced sexual assault or abuse at some point in their lifetime. The reason that I'm showing you these statistics is because sport is a microcosm of society. Effectively, what happens in society also happens within sport. And it's really important to recognize that sport cannot be immune from wider societal ills. And in fact, there are aspects of the sporting culture which can perpetuate the cases. So if we look at the what we're really going into the detail now of harassment and abuse in sport, I'd like to share with you some statistics. So firstly, when we talk about harassment and abuse, we might often think that we're talking about sexual abuse, sexual harassment, which are forms of harassment and abuse. But the IOC consensus statement recognizes five main forms of harassment and abuse, which are psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual harassment, sexual abuse and neglect, with psychological abuse really being at the center of all these forms of abuse. And it's really important to remember this because oftentimes what can happen is if we purely look at one aspect of harassment and abuse, we can inadvertently direct 
too much attention over there and then therefore create vulnerabilities um, in harassment and abuse in other areas. So evidence shows, study indicate that 40 to 50% of athletes have experienced anything from mild harassment to severe abuse. Research also shows that sexual abuse in sport impacts between two to 8% of all athletes. And I know these are really shocking figures, but as I say, sport being a wider part of society, it is something that we need to understand and appreciate so that we can build mechanisms to prevent it. And 75% of young athletes in organized sport have experienced some form of psychological or emotional abuse. You may be familiar with the US Center for Safe Sport. That's a center that has been set up within the US to deal with any issues of harassment and abuse. Um, last year, they were reporting 239 cases coming to them a month. Again, these, these statistics, though they are shocking, they're not, the, the idea of them is also to try and demonstrate that this is something that really impact sport and we know that it's across sorry <laughs> wrong slide we know that it's across every sport every country and worldwide which is why we as sports organizations as professionals working within sport really need to understand what we can do and where our roles and responsibilities lie so there are certain factors within sport which can unfortunately perpetuate or provide put, put athletes at a higher risk. And some of these factors of the sporting culture, and this is a slide which is taken from the Council of Europe's Start to Talk campaign, include things like the hierarchy of sport, um, a medals-based reward structure, or effectively you know, putting medals or achievement above athlete welfare or the culture of caring. Um, and effectively, whenever you have cases of harassment and abuse, there's always a power differential, the exploitation of a power differential. And that's the same no matter whether we're talking about in sport, in education, in any aspect of society. It's the exploitation of a power differential and sport being hierarchical doesn't contain power differentials. But there's important things that we can do to avoid harassment and abuse and to protect all athletes and people participating in sport. This is one thing that I'd really like to share because I find this really interesting. Um, this is a study that we conducted at the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires. When we're looking to try and see what we can do to prevent harassment and abuse in sport, we need to understand if athletes actually recognize their rights if her, in terms of safe sport, if they understand what constitutes harassment and abuse, um, if they know who they can go to, things like this, as well as their responsibilities towards safe sport. So we actually found when we did a survey of the Youth Olympic Games that 44% of athletes didn't know what constitutes harassment and abuse. So this is one of the areas that we can look at. Do people, do athletes, do those working in sport understand effectively their own roles and responsibilities in this area? A couple of points on the impact of harassment and abuse. Um, there are many negative impacts of harassment and abuse. Um, they can be long-standing and extremely damaging. And the impacts to athletes include physical impacts, cognitive impacts, emotional impacts, can also have behavioral, mental health, relational and economic impacts. And this is why it's so important for us to put safeguards in place to ensure that we try and prevent harassment and abuse in sport. Similarly, uh, the impacts for sports organizations are also severe. And they can include um, loss of fans, loss of sponsorships, asset de depreciation. This is, for example, a case study of the Larry Nasser case, which was an awful case which shocked, rocked the entire sporting community back in 2016. Um, and you can see here some of the statistics just purely from the financial side um, and also from uh, in terms of uh, the reputational impact that this had. I'd now like to show you a very short clip. Um, and this is a clip, um, if Christian would be happy to show the video. It's um, from a news channel related to when uh, there was investigations related to harassment and abuse in South Korea. Just to note before I show this video that it's really important to, to remember that harassment and abuse in sport, unfortunately, we know that it occurs in all countries and in all sports. So this is not to shine a specific spotlight on South Korea, but I think it's a really um, got some core messages in it that we should uh, should show. So Christian, could you show the video for me? 
Moving on to other stories now. Some say the recent series of testimonies about violence and sexual assault in the, the South recent South series of testimonies paints a shameful portrait of the country's pursuit of becoming one of the elite sporting powerhouses in the world. Wang Jinghuan sheds light on the deep-rooted factors that lead young athletes to tolerate such violence in the sporting arena. The Me Too movement that has swept through Korea's sport community may be just the tip of the iceberg. According to data released by the Korean Sport and Olympic Committee last week, 860 coaches and athletes faced disciplinary measures such as suspensions over reports of irregularities and abuse in the last five years. But 300 of them were either reinstated or hired elsewhere after their suspension expired. And in 24 other cases, that happened even before their punishment ended. The evidence shows that most names cannot but suffer violence and abuse in silence due to fear of retaliation. It has become practically a given that offenders in elite groups in the sports industry are able to return to the field, exposing young athletes and victims to further abuse by the same perpetrators. Coaches in particular are able to scout and foster young talents in the form of apprenticeships. As such, young athletes who fall victim to abuse often choose to stay silent in fear of ruining their careers. Scores and rankings suddenly become more important than integrity or personal principles. And this deeply rooted system has led to the notion that sexual violence is a given in the sports arena. But experts say any movement targeting wrongdoers should not arbitrarily generalize as it could also affect innocent people and cause more harm than good. I see this as individual acts and not problems of the system. There are many athletes and related officials out there who work really hard to achieve their dreams. So we should not really focus on the cause and effect relationship regarding recent incidents, but rather focus on ways to properly deal with guilty offenders, no matter how outstanding or important they are. Although there is increasing public anger and that there can finally be a much needed change in the industry. Won Jong-un, Arirang News. Thank you very much, Christian, for showing that short video. As I said, there's some really important key messages in there um, that, we, that we can take on board. So if we go back to the presentation, um, I'd just like to move on to the section where we talk about what we as sports organizations can do. So thank you very much. There we go. So where lies our responsibility and what can we do? So the ISC consensus statement of 2016 notes that there's a legal and moral duty of care incumbent on those who organize sport to ensure the risks of non-accidental violence are identified and mitigated. And sometimes this can seem like, especially after presentations such as this with the introduction, that it is such a huge area and where do we start? It's also different depending on which area of sport that you're working in, if you're working in grassroots level sport, if you're working in, uh, in legacy planning for major sporting events in different areas. But the fact is, is that when we look at the prevention of harassment and abuse in sport, it's actually the implementation of many small changes that we can do as a first line of defense to protect athletes and to protect everyone that's working within sport. And there are lots of materials out there to help you and the other good thing to know is that it shouldn't always just fall on one person. Uh, effectively, there are already frameworks and there are, it's a, an area that is very cross-disciplinary. So the, so the development of a team of people with different backgrounds working together is always, or usually the best way forward when we're looking at this. So when I talk about, for example, the frameworks that exist, I wanted to highlight just a couple of them here. I'm not going to go into detail because we don't have the time. But there are foundational framework and frameworks that exist to guide sports organization and that also effectively provide the basis for why sports organizations must act in this area. And they include the International Charter on Physical Education, Physical Activity and Sport, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which effectively looks at the three pillars of in, in terms of this area, so protect, respect and remedy. The Sporting Chance Principles on Sport and Human Rights, 
and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And although these aren't specifically sport focused, I thought it was important to mention as there are aspects and sport is recognized as being a vehicle through which the UN Sustainable Development Goals can be achieved and reached, including, for example, uh, goal number five, which is gender equality. So the question that I want to ask you guys and uh, the question that we must ask ourselves working in sport, um, is it a game of risk, risk and liability versus values? Oftentimes, you know, we hear, OK, but sports organizations primarily are looking at developing or running sports competitions. Um, we're looking at the development of sport, but child protection, all these other things are actually they're not really part of the core functions of sports organizations. Um, they're sort of separate. But sports organizations are effectively also values-based education, uh, sorry, excuse me, values-based organizations. And therefore those values, which must be intrinsic to sport, must be shown through sport in terms of whether we're looking at grassroots development or in terms of whether we're looking at a major sporting events. We also have the question of action versus reaction. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of organizations really looking at implementing the prevention of harassment and abuse in sports uh, strategies and initiatives and this is wonderful um, but what's really important is to ensure that it doesn't take a case for sports organizations to then act and as we saw at the beginning if we look at statistics we can almost definitely or very probably say that cases of harassment and abuse are occurring within your sports sector for sure and so if an organization doesn't have policies and procedures in place or a strategy to look to try and prevent this from happening, will it take a case for you to then be reactive about it to start to implement mechanisms? And, you know, one case is one case too many, which is another thing to try and to try and take on board. So effectively, what I like to think of in the end is that through sport, we should avoid causing harm and think about the concept of sport as a catalyst for good. And that's where a lot of this work lies. So considerations for major sporting events. Um, again, the aspect, the, the topic of the prevention of harassment and abuse in sport has implications across the entire sporting sector. Um, and I think it's very interesting as well to look at, for example, in terms of grassroots sport, this is hugely important. But I wanted to raise some specific um, uh, points related to major sporting events because I think this is very important and perhaps uh, less of a focus. So this is a wonderful in infographic. It's actually um, from the Center for Sports and Human Rights and this looks at, this was infographic was looking specifically at the human rights um, uh, when we look at major sporting events and all the different parts of, of, of developing and, and hosting a, a major sporting event and where we should consider human rights. Um, and I just noted down the side some of the things that we should look about in terms of the prevention of harassment and abuse. So, for example, concept and legacy, um, bidding and host city contracts. How does child protection or the prevention of abuse, um, how is that included within bidding and host city contracts? Um, displacement is another one that's really important. Child labor and exploitation. Initiatives for the prevention of trafficking. There's a really good um, organization, NGO, that, that, that looks at the prevention of trafficking around major sporting events. And I remember listening to a presentation and they said around some of the biggest sporting events, such as the um, Super Bowl, the FIFA World Cup and the Olympic Games, trafficking, not specifically related to sport, but trafficking in that area can go up by 300 percent. So this is huge. What uh, where is our responsibility as sports organizations? What's our responsibility um, there? Even if it might not be directly related to the sport, it's an impact of uh, a sporting action. Um, special provisions for young athletes are super important when we're thinking of accreditation, accommodation. So the whole logistics of, of, the, of the sleeping arrangements, um, safeguarding policies, education, data protection, and child-specific risk assessments. So again, I know this is a huge long list, but I think it's really important to consider these because usually the, the idea of the prevention of harassment and abuse or child protection really takes on its sort of its own area. It's like there's someone dealing with that and they're over there and we don't see them as an intrinsic and central part to even the planning and operations of a major sporting event. 
I did promise a whistle-stop tour, and this is definitely what it's been. Again, happy to answer any questions and also to uh, to go more into detail at another time if you'd like to hear more on these things. But I also wanted to raise some current context uh, considerations related to COVID-19. And this may seem a little bit left field because, you know, COVID-19 at the moment, we're actually seeing a huge reduction of, of, of for example, uh, of everything, <laughs> but uh, of sports participation. But I did think it was quite interesting um, just to note that sport sometimes can also be the only safe space. And this is something um, that we've heard actually when we've been working with a survivor of um, sexual abuse in sport um, in Canada. But he he often says, you know, sometimes for, for, for kids, especially sport can be the only safe place. And this is backed up by evidence that we know that 90 percent of child sexual abuse victims know their perpetrator in some way and they're very close to them. So it's important to know that right now with the cessation of most sporting activities, um, it actually causes a disruption of social and protection networks including sporting networks and the impact that this can also have especially on children at this time um, so oh sorry let, click through to the next slide uh, it's not pushing it and the UNICEF um, recently have have done some fantastic information on this and I really recommend that you you take a look at this but effectively they note that we must prevent this pandemic from turning into a crisis of child protection and I really recommend that those who are working, for example, in grassroots sport, um, this is quite an interesting uh, thing to consider because it may be that right now with the disruption of the of, of sporting networks, um, that that safety net has actually been taken away. And there's also, for example, we know there's an increase right now of um, online exploitations and things like this due to the massive increase in screen time um, that's happening. So I'd like to finish this uh, very quick webinar with um, with um, some links on materials and resources that are out there. So again, just like to reiterate the point that although we've gone through a lot of content and it seems like a, it's a, it's such a huge area to tackle, safeguarding is a, it's really a three step defense and set with safeguarding being the first part of that. And so it's really lots of little things that you can put in place to ensure that sport remains a safe place for everyone to train and compete in. So there are huge, uh, there's a huge number of resources which are out there to assist sports organizations. So there's, for example, the IOC work, including the Prevention of Harassment and Abuse in Sport Toolkit. There's an amazing program in Europe at the moment called Voices for Truth and Dignity, which is, which is developed and set up and run by survivors of abuse in sport. There's the UNICEF International Safeguard for Children in Sport, which is having fantastic impacts across the globe, especially at the grassroots level. And the Council of Europe Pro Safe Sports um, Plus project as well is, is um, focusing on, on sport participation within Europe. Um, so these are some fantastic resources. I really recommend that you have a look at them. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> I know I went quite quickly, but if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And thank you for your time. Hey, Kirsty, that was what a fantastic, as you say, a whistle stop tour into such a really quite a broad and diverse uh, topic, um, but you presented it brilliantly. Um, and I want to say thank you very much uh, for covering such an important topic. I think what moves me and what has moved me about this series of presentations is that um, I think it's easy uh, to fall into the, the behavior or habit of doing and focusing on major sport event delivery, which is where my background is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'm really grateful for with having this series is being introduced to topics which I know exist, which are really important, but being able to dive into them through webinars like this, uh, through being able to sit and chat with yourself and talk and understand it better. Because I think it really helps support our uh, the, the, the breadth of our industry, but the mm -hmm. importance of these topics in our industry. Um, so I really want to say thank you for taking the time and sharing with us. Um, and I think there are some key points there maybe that we will revisit um, and maybe do a little bit, a deep dive. We'll check it out with the, with the community and see which uh, topics have the most interest. But I think there's some really important things there that we could uh, certainly go into. Mm, thank so you. thank you. I want to say that. So <laughs> we've got some questions um, coming up. Uh, there we go. I'm just going to quickly read through. So I'm going to, sorry, I'm just going to write it down. So Marianne, as a, 
uh, from Marian. Uh, as a spectator and, a, and an MSC, how could we help prevent harassment and abuse at sport? For example, in the human traffic you mentioned. It's a good question. It's a very good question. And I think, so from the role of spectator, it's quite interesting. So there have been campaigns which have been run around major sporting events um, uh, by a charity called It's a Penalty, I believe. And um, they've actually been running. So for example, when you, for people that are flying in as spectators for the events, there's information on how to recognize, for example, the signs of trafficking and what to do. And, and there's also a helpline that you can then call through. And those, uh, they run a campaign campaign around most major sporting events linking up um, with local with national authorities as well so that's really important and they have information for example in the taxis and they have information in the hotels it's a fantastic campaign so I know that there's a, some work um, that's out there at the moment looking at that but I think you know it's a really good question because as a spectator, what can you do? I think an important thing is to recognize the signs of human trafficking and some of the things that you perhaps might not be aware of. Um, initially, you know, even when you're on a plane, actually, it's a really um, important point. Um, and then there's the other side of it as what can sports organizations do? And I think for sports organizations, again, it comes to the point of how much do we recognize that we should provide remedy for a human rights abuse that may not be directly linked to our actions but has an indirect but definite link to the actions and so definitely looking beyond the immediate perhaps human right concerns and broadening that scope um, I think it's a hugely important um, a hugely important thing that sports organizations can do and that really ties in with the UN guiding principles for businesses I think um, I understand FIFA's just signed up to those and, and that very much um, is one of the areas but it's a great question thank you very much Marianne that's great so next question uh, by Omando uh, hello, Kirsty. Is there any specific guideline or procedure to follow to report an incident in the sport world? To whom should an athlete go to report an incident? That's a great question as well. It's another fantastic question. Um, so right now I know that the IOC is doing a lot of work in um, assisting national federations, international federations and national Olympic committees to implement their own um, policies to prevent harassment and abuse and one of the key factors in having a policy is ensuring that there is a reporting hotline and that there is some there is someone who is trained and able to receive that report and action it at the end of it. Um, however it, it has not been uptaken so far across you know we're looking at the entire Olympic movement there um, and I know that other organizations such as FIFA are working with their member states, uh, their national federations, sorry, to have them implement similar matters. So effectively, it, the answer is, is that there should be, but right now, one that is global, that reaches all sports and all um, across all countries, it's very difficult. Um, there are organizations who work in this field um, and there are, na especially at the national level, so for example, we've got the Child, Prote Child Protection and Sport Unit in the UK. Um, I would like to point out that harassment and abuse in sport is not purely a child focused thing, it also happens to adults, so, you know. Um, but I think right now, sports organizations have really understood that there is a need to create uh, a reporting hotline or a way that athletes can report harassment and abuse and I also think that right now it's not so clear where they should and that makes it extremely difficult because reporting a case is so hard and um, we've spoken to survivors that say that conversation when they first tell someone is the most difficult conversation they've ever had and the way that that person then responds to it is so crucially important um, and what's happening right now a lot of the time is you know sports organizations aren't prepared in terms of having policies and strategies in place and then suddenly they receive this information and not knowing what to do to do with it it also can lead to for example an investigation dropping uh, a confidentiality breach a disclosure and things like this so I wish there was an answer to a question that there was one global place that athletes could go to um, but I think it very much at the moment is dependent on the sport federation and also national policies and things that are in place. So would that be linked to things like the NSPCC, so going back to the existing organisations that deal with those, I mean again just sort of thinking about where, you, where people could go. Um, using those traditional routes of rep reporting abuse because they've already set up a structure, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so 
it, it really we're looking at different things so for example if this is abuse that could also be criminal uh, there are always the statutory the national um and that should be your first place of call i think especially if something's criminal it is really important that um you know law enforcement and and you know you can also tell for example someone within your sports organization if you've got a safeguarding officer or a lead there but they will always have to refer then to, through the national um the legal channels if it's a criminal case so there's always that pathway for the criminal case what's more difficult are cases that breach what the minimum standard of behavior that we expect in sport things that might not be criminal but have a devastating impact and are recognized as forms of harassment and abuse this is more tricky um, because there are for example organizations like safe sport who are set up within the us they have specifically been set up to handle any case of harassment and abuse whether it be criminal whether it not be criminal um, within the us now that doesn't there are other organizations that exist similar in different countries, but there's not one that exists globally. But I think what's really important right now is there has been a huge uptake of safeguarding policies across, I know for sure, the Olympic movement. So I know international federations are really looking at this, which means that the international federation is also one area that you should definitely be able to go to. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So another question here, uh, what, may be, what may be the most important policy to apply at a major junior sporting event? I guess this gets back to your safeguarding of those three steps perhaps. Yeah, um, I think this is really, well, I think education, I know that's not a policy, but I think education is one of the, the most important things that we should, one of the problems in terms of um, international sport is it's really hard to to get that face to face time with athletes and to really get, help them to understand their rights and their responsibilities in this area. And we do know, for example, that studies have shown that peer to peer abuse is also extremely high. In fact, peer to peer abuse, there was one study in Zambia and it had some really interesting when they were looking at um, perpetrators of, of sexual assault. It was actually more from the peer to peer as opposed to other people in people in the area. And different studies it's different in different contexts but um peer-to-peer -peer abuse is 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 also prevalent and I, so i think education is one of the key things that we should do at junior sporting events um because you really have that time that face-to-face -face time with athletes to help them understand their rights and their responsibilities that being said when you have education what can happen is it can make people realize that perhaps something that they have been experiencing is actually not okay and yeah. so it's really crucial then to back up that education with a safeguarding policy, effectively meaning that there is somewhere that athletes can go to disclose mm -hmm. and there is someone that they can disclose to who knows what to do with that disclosure. Yeah. Um, so that's I think that's really, really important. And there are blueprints for safeguarding policies at events out there. Um, and uh, we've, I'm happy to send you a couple if, you, if you'd like to see them. Okay. I know there's a couple of good tools on the ISC uh, through the athletes. Athlete 365 has safeguarding guidelines. Um, they've also got a reporting tool. But as you say, that's more focused on Olympic sports, not necessarily grassroots. But Yeah, the ISC work, I mean, I'm a consultant for the ISC, so it's a bit interesting. I know the ISC work very well, but there is a lot of information on 365, what they do at the um, Youth Olympic Games, the Olympic Games, and um, and there's some fantastic work, work in there. And also there's a reporting hotline, which is open at the Olympic Games and Youth Olympic Games, yeah. That's yeah, great. Okay, um, so that's covered most of the questions we've covered today. Um, Kirsty, look, I want to say thank you so much uh, for your time um, and coming and giving and, and covering this really important topic. Um, I want to say thanks to all our, our guests online for joining us. Um, it's great to have so many of you here um, from all over the world uh, to talk about this important topic. Um, as Kirsty mentioned, we'll be sharing this online through sportworker.com. You'll be able to see all of the uh, this as an article um, we'll be able to answer continue the discussion if you've got further questions um, and as Kirsty mentioned in her presentation there are some direct links if you do need to follow up or if you have some concerns about any of this topic because it is a quite a sensitive topic topic um, please do feel free to make those contacts um, Kirsty any last comments from you no, I would just like to say thank you very much uh, indeed and uh, and again I think really just to underline the fact that uh, we have done a very broad overview, but this is really something I think no matter which area of sport that you work in, um, 
there is always a way that it's perhaps good to to understand where your role and your responsibility might be and even how this can play into um, the work that you do. I think a lot of the time, so um, there was a really good comment on there about anti-doping, for example, and how there's similar areas. And, and we do find that our work in the prevention of harassment and abuse is very streamlined with things like anti-doping, with mental health, with gender equality, with different areas. And that actually these areas of ethics and integrity, they're really embedded within every aspect of sporting, of, of the sporting culture and with sporting operations. And so I really thank you so much for everyone that's come to listen today. And um, yeah, really happy to speak about this further at, at, at any point. And um, I hope everyone stays healthy and happy. <laughs> Great. Yeah, likewise. Okay, thanks so much, Kirsty. Thank you again for everyone for joining us. Um, and we look forward to, again, I think we'll have some great follow-ups with Kirsty in, in, not, in not too not too distant future. Okay, stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, Kirsty, and, and your team. Uh, and we'll speak to you soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Bye.